Welcome. Thank you for joining us for week three of our midweek Bible study, where we're doing the series Befriend with Scott Saul. Has there ever been something that you just weren't able to do? Maybe it was a task you couldn't accomplish or, or something that you just didn't have uh, the strength to do. Nothing makes you feel more helpless than a jar that you can't open. Am I right? Have you ever had that moment where you're trying to open something and you just can't do it? What makes it even worse is when you hand that jar to somebody else and they pop it open with no problem. Usually you need to say something like, I loosen that for you, to make yourself feel a little better. The truth is that no one likes to feel helpless or weak. And oftentimes it's our failure that leads us to feel this way. When I was in college, my brother and I and some friends went to Big Bend National Park to do a hike, a three-day hike around a 30-mile trail. I, I thought I was really quite the outdoorsman, and so things like water weren't that necessary. I ended up getting very dehydrated, got very sick, it got a little bit serious there for a period of time. But we got home and everybody's asking how the trip was. I was super embarrassed because I thought of myself as this great outdoorsman, but I was so weak I could barely walk by the time the trip was over. See, this, this was something I did to myself. I thought that I was strong enough to do it without the need of things that were essential. And it ended up bringing me to a place where I was so weak I could hardly function. And then that led me to quite a bit of embarrassment. Today, we're going to talk about how we can recognize our own weakness and sin, when we can do that, our relationships will be stronger than ever. When we're able to recognize the things going on in our own lives, when we're able to have that level of openness, it allows our relationships to become even stronger. In our first video we're going to watch today, we're going to see the story of Matt and how he allowed drinking to almost be the end of his marriage. His weakness and sin went unchecked. It became a wedge between him and God, and it definitely became a wedge between him and and his wife. There's a couple things I want you to watch for as we watch the first section of our video with Matt and with Scott today. The first thing is to think about how Matt's sin affects his relationships with God and with his wife because there's no doubt that sin affects his relationships. And the second thing to watch for is how was he able to find reconciliation and deepen his relationships with his wife and God. You see, the good news here is that just because weakness and sin can cause rift and separation in our relationships, it doesn't mean things have to stay that way. We can actually have reconciliation where things come back together and can end up stronger than they ever were in the first place. So as we watch this video, let's focus on Matt and the effects of his sin, and let's focus on the reconciliation that happened between his wife and God. Welcome back. So far in the series, we've been setting up what we need in order to be a good friend. Scott's walked us through what it means to befriend ourselves and God, but friendships require action. And we can't just sit back and hope people become our friends automatically. We have to work for it. These next few sessions focus on specific principles we all need to grasp and live out in order to be a good friend. This session looks at the reality we all know to be true, but hate to admit. We are weak. We sin and hurt people through our sin. We will mess up. We cannot avoid it. But there is a godly way to admit our weakness and move beyond them in order to befriend others. Matt's story illustrates how much our sin can damage our relationship. Take a look. So in my childhood, uh, I dealt with a lot of stuff that I didn't really have a good outlet for. There wasn't a lot of communication in the house that I grew up in. Uh, as a result of that, I bottled a lot of things up. Um, alcohol became really attractive to me. I was drinking on the weekends, going to church on Sunday mornings, going to mission trips, active in my church, but sort of naturally sort of led this double life. And when I got married, um, I naturally brought that in and started drinking more, um, staying out more often, and it just led to a marriage that was just a shell of itself and within the first few years we really just kind of became roommates. The only thing I would do with him honestly was just sit on the sofa with him and we'd watch TV kind of um, without a state of love. There was no love between us. It was just a brokenness. I kept 
weaving together different lies about where I was because I didn't want to come clean about how much I was drinking. And so it just got to a point to where I just retreated and sometimes I actually didn't come home at all and then it just led to my drinking just became more and more um, to where I couldn't control it. And then it was about six years ago now, I was out drinking with my coworkers and I hit a telephone pole and um, as a result, I, I got arrested for a DWI. I mean, I was destroyed. I just completely put up this wall, this big wall against Matt, against God, um, against my friends too. It just, I became a different person. I just remember sitting in the prison cell that night and I just knew that things had to change. And so at that point I called Janet. I just told her everything and I told her all the nights when I wasn't home, I was out drinking, I wasn't working and it just, I didn't really know where to turn. I was at my rock bottom and I knew that I needed help and I needed it from somewhere. So I heard about um, a recovery program called Celebrate Recovery. Uh, and so I started attending it at one of the local churches. And you know, it was through that process that I actually understood that I am an alcoholic and I am an addict and I have an addictive personality and that you know, there was a lot of damage that I caused. It was difficult to see him changing because all I could see was he was the man who's completely ruining our family. And at the time when it happened, I was pregnant with my second child. And I literally thought to myself, how could he do this to our family? Truly the reconciliation started coming when I was working personally on my relationship with the Lord. And I stopped concentrating on what Matt was doing and being so concerned about how he was doing and is he reading the Bible, is he praying? And I really started realizing that I am forgiven for everything I've done. I am forgiven for all the thoughts I had against God. And our marriage changed at that point. Once I was able to stop fixating on all the mistakes I made and stop fixating on my past mistakes, the shame that I had built up forever about that. And once I realized that he just wants to know me and he wants to just talk to me and have a relationship with me, it transformed the way I perceived everything. It's just released all the chains that he had already unlocked. I just kept on me because I didn't know any different and I'm able to truly let go of that. And through that, I see Janet in a different light. I see myself in a different light. And me naturally growing with him has made my relationship with Janet just grow exponentially. Matt's story shows us the ugly truth about how sin can impact people and relationships. His addiction led him to a place of hiding and living a lie even with his wife. Those sins tore their marriage apart and it took a long time for them to reconcile. One thing we can learn from Matt and Janet is how important it is to be honest about how sin affects our relationships and how we're meant to fight against sin together. There is no such thing as a sin that does not damage relationships. Sin alienates us from God. When we don't trust someone, we put our guard up. We say, don't go there. And, and when we're alienated from God through sin, we do put our guards up with him. And we, in, in all sorts of ways, say, don't go there. Sin also alienates us from ourselves. We become disjointed because God's word is actually given to us in the same way that fish uh, are given water. A fish flourishes and thrives inside the water and the fish becomes anxious and restless and, 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 and the fish's life is even threatened if the fish is taken out of water. In the same way, you take a human being out of the design and out of the beautiful life-giving boundaries that God's Word has given us. It's like taking a fish out of water. We become anxious and afraid and restless and eventually it kills us. To that degree, we end up hurting ourselves and not just those around us. But sin also alienates us from others. We shift blame, we gossip, we put other people down, we use our tongues in hurtful ways toward others uh, to divert attention away from our own sin, our own contribution to the dysfunction, and we go on the attack. But the invitation of Jesus is to come out of hiding in the same way that God was inviting Adam and Eve to come out of hiding when they hid from him and from each other. We are secure in his love. And because we are secure in his love, 
we can become transparent about the very best things in us and about the very worst things in us. We can be more honest with ourselves, with God, and with other people about those parts of us that are not complete yet. Uh, this opens the door for intimacy and deeper friendship with each other. And we see this uh, for Matt and Janet. They eventually discovered how the environment that Jesus had provided for them, the environment that says there's no condemnation for you in Christ, there's nothing in all creation that can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ. You are safe. You are a protected species uh, in the kingdom of God. That gave them the freedom to then reconcile with one another, to come out into the open with one another about their own sins, about their own weaknesses. And, and uh, again, they became allies instead of enemies. Uh, they moved more together instead of apart because of the climate that Jesus has created for them. In the same way that, that we would want to help a fish get back into the water, they helped one another get back into the habitat of God's life-giving design. Hope you enjoyed that first part of the video. The truth is, it's never easy for us to look at ourselves in the mirror and be honest, is it? For Matt, and for us, that's the only way to confront the sin in our lives. For Matt in the video, until he was able to look real, really at himself, truthfully at himself, he was never able to get the help and make the changes he needed. For us as well, if we can't look at ourselves honestly in the mirror, it's going to be difficult for us to have that reconciliation that we know is so important. And see, Scott did a great job highlighting how sin alienates us from God, from our own desires, and from others. See, sin is the things we think we want. It's the things we think will give us what we want. But the truth is, sin often does the opposite of what we want. It, it, it creates rifts in our relationship. It divides us from God. And then often that can send us in a spiral of weakness and shame where sin creates more sin, creates more division, creates more. It's not until we confront those things that we're able to have the reconciliation that we want and to have the relationships that we want. See, when we're confident in God's love, we can be open and honest without fear. I think a lot of times we have this fear that if we're open and honest that maybe God won't love and accept us anymore. Maybe other people won't love and accept us anymore. But when we have this confidence in God's love that it's without condition, that it's not about our action, that God's love is indefinite, and that it's always going to be there, then we can be open about the things that we're struggling with. We don't have to fear that God will leave us or turn his back on us, but we know that he'll be with us every step of the way. What I want for you to do is I want for you to, in just a minute, pause the video, and if you're in a group of people or if you're by yourself, maybe you could just journal some thoughts down. If you're in a group, obviously discuss those or talk to your spouse or your family. And I want you to think about the answers to the following questions as we reflect. First, who have I alienated because I wasn't willing to be honest with myself about my sin? I think each of us probably has a story in our lives where there was somebody that we pushed aside, somebody that there was a rift or a separation in our relationship because we weren't willing to be honest about the things that were going on in our lives. Who might some of those people be? And it's a difficult thing to think about that and to be honest with ourselves about how my actions might have been the thing that drove someone away, or my actions might have been the thing that caused separation in relationships with God or with others. But there's power in writing those things down or in having that conversation with somebody. Again, openness and honesty, knowing that God will never stop loving us. He already knows. When we can be honest, that's the first step often for healing. And then the second thing to pause and reflect about, what can I do to remain confident in God's love and salvation? You see, when we when we're able to have that confidence, when we're able to do things to remind us of God's love, when, we're, when we do things to remind us that our salvation, it's not dependent on our day-to-day -day actions. When we can put things in our life that helps us remember those things. It gives us confidence to, to be honest. It gives us confidence to confront our sin and to move on. So let's pause and reflect as we think about those things.
All right, as we watch our second part of the video, we're going to see a story about Ashley and Caleb. There's a couple things I want for you to be watching for as we see Ashley and Caleb tell their story. The first thing is to think about what sins Caleb was holding on to, despite not seeing himself as the one who did wrong. Oftentimes we sin when we don't even realize we're the one who has sinned in the first place. Maybe somebody does the first thing against us. And then we act all sorts of wrong ways against them. So I want you to think about how Caleb was actually holding on to sin, and he was actually living in sin despite not seeing himself as the one who had done anything wrong. And the second question, as we watch the video, is to think about what role did listening to God play in this couple's story. It was a huge part of their ultimate reconciliation, and it's an important thing for us. So let's focus on both of those things as we watch the second part of this video. I met Ashley in church my senior year. She kind of took my breath away when she walked in the building, and so I did everything that I could to woo her. And very quickly after we got married, his pursuit of of me shifted and just changed. I didn't realize what I had done as far as setting her up for disappointment, and work for me became a really big focus. Um, And when I didn't feel supported, loved, and heard, I would easily escape in my mind to how would this ex-boyfriend have treated me or um, just very much so fantasizing about other men and like in the pursuit of of me, how they would romance me, how things would be different. So I ended up going to a basketball game with some friends and after the game was over, I called one of my old friends and She didn't end up answering the phone, so I called one of her guy friends um, that we used to hang out with, you know, in high school and asked them what they were doing. He said they were just going to go back to to their house and um, that my friend was going to end up coming over there, um, and she never ended up showing up. And so it was just me and this guy friend that I used to hang out with. We just started drinking, and I ended up getting just belligerently drunk that night and starts kissing me and didn't really know, like, in that moment if this was reality or if this was a dream. So I was afraid to confront Caleb and let him know, like, what I just did. And he was obviously incredibly just hurt. There was aspects where, because I didn't trust her, I also felt like I had power over her. Because she kissed another guy, I didn't want to kiss her. And I didn't for a while. And I called my mentor because I didn't know what to do. And he quickly began to reveal the unforgiveness that was in my heart. And in that moment, because I saw how much damage my unforgiveness was causing, the Lord quickly met me there and then allowed me to truly forgive Ashley. I was able to see like how strong his relationship was with the Lord and how he was able to truly love me through that. While all of this was happening, I was driving to work and the Lord was just speaking to me really clearly um, about my pursuit of Ashley and proposed this question, how would you pursue someone if you were going to marry them? And so I said, I would take them on dates and write them notes and get them gifts and um, make time for them, uh, put them as a priority in my life. And then the Lord almost audibly said, do that with your wife. And since then, like, things just really switched. Like, it was for my good that he was doing those things to really minister to my heart and for the glory of the Lord that he actually started serving me, um, loving me well in the things that I actually wanted him to do instead of doing them out of obligation. That's really, like, when we were united and our marriage really just grew and flourished from there. Caleb and Ashley's story reassures us that reconciliation is possible. Yes, we will all sin. Maybe not in the same way Ashley did, but we will all do things that hurt the people we love the most. But with God in the picture, he makes reconciliation something we can work toward, just as Caleb and Ashley did. By grace, through faith, God restores our relationship with him that has been broken by sin. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, it talks about how God has removed the dividing wall of hostility. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me from the cross? It was so that God would never have to forsake us. 
Uh, he has moved us from being his enemies to his friends, from being strangers to his daughters and sons, from being spiritually homeless to giving us an everlasting seat at his table. Uh, being reconciled to God actually has implications in our relationships with each other as well. And it creates this whole beautiful, messy opportunity as well for diversity. It talks about in the scriptures how when we are reconciled with God, when those dividing walls of hostility are torn down between us and God, they will also be torn down between people and people. Ephesians continues, the dividing wall of hostility has been removed between Jew and Gentile. These are two groups with very significant differences, socio-politically, religiously, uh, nationally, etc. Galatians 3.28 also talks about how in Christ there is no longer Jew or Gentile. This speaks to racial differences, political differences, religious differences. It says there's no longer male and female, to tensions that, that come between the genders. There's no slave and free. This speaks to class differences, economic differences, power dynamics, and so on. We are all equals in dignity and honor and worth and value in the sight of God through Jesus. Paul, did you ever notice this? It starts so many of his letters with the words grace and peace to you. Grace to you was the standard salutation in a letter from a Gentile to a Gentile. Peace to you was the standard salutation in a Jewish letter. It's as if Paul at the beginning of all his letters is saying reconciliation, reconciliation, reconciliation is a key application of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Reconciliation is not an option for the people of God. It's an imperative. It's a moral command. It's as if Jesus is saying, if you want friendship with me, you have to pursue friendship with every other person who is part of my bride. Could you imagine somebody saying to you, I want to be your friend, but your spouse, I don't want them in my life. You're going to say, no way. It's a package deal, right? We come together, and Jesus as well says, my church and me, we are one and the same. And so if I love them, then it's, it's a call for you to love them. If I've reconciled myself to them, then it's a call for you as well to reconcile to them. And yet even in Christ, we who are reconciled through him will still sin against each other, as we saw in the video. But the gospel gives us resources to deal with our sin against each other in a healthy and life-giving way. It frees us to confess our sins to one another. It frees us to apologize to one another. It frees us to forgive one another uh, as the Holy Spirit works through that process. And so let's reconcile where we can under Christ so that we can help one another along. This session reminded us our relationships are broken because sin stains this world and we have no way of removing it on our own. But through Jesus, reconciliation is possible. He empowers us to confront the sin that tears us apart and moves us towards forgiveness. That's what we saw with Matt and Janet and with Caleb and Ashley. God moved in their lives in amazing ways to reconcile their relationships. So what is it for you? Maybe you have a friendship that's been torn apart for years and neither of you have taken a step towards forgiveness. Or maybe there's a sin in your life that's distancing you from those you love the most. Whatever it may be, now is the time to act. Consider talking over what you've learned in this session with your group or a trusted friend. And as you process this session, pray together that God would work to reconcile your relationships. See you next time. What a great video. And Scott brings some wonderful points to the table. Sin and spiritual weakness drive a wedge between us and others. But God is all about reconciliation. In fact, he calls us to a ministry of reconciliation. How can we bring other people back to God? How can we bring other people back to each other? Repentance is not easy or comfortable, but the alternative is a life of pain and loneliness. This idea of confronting things that are difficult, often it, it dissuades us from doing it in the first place. We think, I don't want to do that because it might cause 
something else to happen that would be bad, or it's going to be so hard to look myself in the mirror and be honest, or it might be too difficult for me to stand in front of someone and admit sin to them, because what if there's repercussions, or because what if they change the way they look at me or the way they view me? But the reality is if we're not willing to do that difficult task of repentance between God and with others, it's going to cause isolation and loneliness. In fact, I think in America, our lack of this idea of repentance between one another might be some of the reason that people feel so isolated and siloed off. When we do repent, it opens relationships to a level of depth that maybe they could never have achieved otherwise. When we're honest with each other about our weakness, when we're vulnerable with other people, it drives those relationships to depth and and, and to, to being beneficial for both parties in a way that makes them so full of life, in a way that truly can impact the course of our lives. God has so much in store for us. And He doesn't demand perfection. He calls us to perfection, but He loves us in spite of our imperfection. But He does want us to be honest and open in the times where we sin and fall short. He does want us to be willing to ask for forgiveness. The Scripture tells us we must ask for forgiveness for the things that we've done that were wrong. There's some things as we close that I want, to, I want for you to discuss with those around you if you're in a group or your spouse or your family. If you're alone, please journal these things out. I know it's difficult or maybe seems awkward. We don't like to put pen to paper on things that are uncomfortable to talk about because that, that writing on the paper actually kind of confronts us with the truth. But I would challenge you to journal about these things as we close. The first is how could the sins that you're holding on to be affecting your relationship with God and others? All of us hold on to some kind of sin. We all hold tight those dark places in our heart. But how might that sin actually be causing the opposite of what we want? How might it be a wedge between our relationship with God or others? Maybe we think, I wish I was closer to God. But what are we doing to ask for repentance and forgiveness for the sins that we do hold on to? Also, why is it so hard to confess sins when we know that God will never stop loving us? We know His love is unconditional and His love is eternal but it's still difficult for us to come to the things that we struggle with with Him. And then what is one step that we could take to reconciliation with a relationship this week? Maybe that's our relationship with God. What's one step we could take to reconcile ourselves to God? Maybe there's a person in our lives who we have created distance with because of sin. Maybe it's our sin, maybe it's theirs. Maybe they sinned first, but we've been holding on to things like what we saw with Caleb. And that's actually causing some sort of bitterness in our heart. What's one step we could take to reconciling with someone this week? I'm going to pray, and then I hope that you'll talk about those things or journal journal about those things as we close. So let's pray, church. Dear God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all the ways that you love us, no matter what we do and in spite of so many things that we do. God, I pray that you will help us to bring reconciliation into the relationships in our lives. I pray that we will see the way that Jesus Christ has reconciled us to you and that we will model that with the way we live our lives trying to reconcile with others. God, I pray that you will put pride aside, that we'll be able to own and be honest about the weaknesses and the sins in our own lives. And God, I pray that we will do everything we can to repent, to ask for forgiveness, to let go of those sins, and to live the life that you're calling us. God, we love you and we want to be like Jesus. So please help us with that every day. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Go in peace, Conroe Church.